and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to cast our eyes skywards and explore some of the mysterious and magical lore associated with the heavens above. We are going to look at how gods and witches battle in the night sky. We'll take a look at what rainbows and comets really mean. Some important advice on how to avoid being targeted by thunder and lightning. And possibly most useful of all, how to avoid turning your children into lunatics. All of that and much, much more will be coming up on this episode. And with so much to squeeze in, I should warn you, there is going to be some quite rapid fire folklore on this episode. It's just going to be interesting fact after interesting fact after interesting fact, and I'll barely have a chance to catch my breath in between. And so, without any further ado, to begin at the beginning. And first up is the moon, a popular subject on this podcast. But on this episode, we are going to look at the ways the colour of the moon can be used to predict such things as the weather. Because Welsh folklore tells us that if a full moon or a new moon are a certain colour, then that could mean good or bad weather. And you'll be glad to know that a 16th century Welsh bard came up with a nice, convenient, easy-to-learn rhyme that we can memorise and recite whenever we see the moon is looking a little bit off shade. And this rhyme, which was composed in the Welsh language, but I will now read to you in the English language, goes like this. Observe ye swain, where ye stand, the pale blue moon will drench the land. Cynthia red portends much wind, when fair the weather fair you'll find. Which is a very fancy and slightly hard to pronounce way of saying that a pale new moon is indicative of rain, especially when surrounded by a cloud film. But a red full moon means a coming storm or wind. Either way, they're not particularly good, but one is rain, the other one is storm or wind. But that wasn't the only way of telling if a storm was coming, and another indication was a single ring or a halo around the moon, while a double ring meant very rough weather. And a triple ring around the moon, or a triple halo around the moon, if one ring wasn't bad enough, if two rings weren't bad enough, if you saw three rings you would have a spell of unusual weather. And unusual weather could be something absolutely bonkers like snow in the summertime or sunbathing weather in January. Of course, that would depend in what part of the world you are in. Certainly here in Wales, you wouldn't go sunbathing in January. You wouldn't go sunbathing in most months thinking about it. But wherever you might be listening from, just think of your own unusual weather. And that is what you might get if you saw three rings around the moon. Now, as for good weather, very briefly, there's a lot of bad weather lore. But very briefly, as for good weather, if the moon appears very bright and clear, after three days old, then fine weather is promised. So if the moon is three days old, bright and clear, fine weather is on the way. A clear moon denotes frost, but a dull moon indicates rain. So that good weather didn't last long. We're already back into bad weather again. And if the new moon looks high, cold weather may be expected. But when it seems to be down low, warm weather is promised. When the moon is clearly seen in the daytime, cool days may be expected. And if the new moon appears with points upwards, and by points what they mean is when you see the, 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 the crescent moon with the points at either end, if the points are upwards, this month will be dry. But if her horns point downwards, the month will be more or less rainy. And yes, I did say her then. In Welsh folklore, the moon is feminine as I've spoken about on previous episodes and as I'm about to speak about again on this episode, because the Welsh say when the moon looks like a golden boat, which is the crescent at the bottom, I'm sure you can picture it on its back, the month will be wet. And if you're wondering why it's referred to as a boat, why does this 
crescent moon look like and why is it described as a boat in Welsh folklore? Well, the boat-like appearance of the moon is possibly a remnant of the Ceriadwen or Ceridwen myth. And that is a name I am sure many of you will be familiar with because of her, her witchy connections nowadays. But Ceridwen or Ceriadwen, depending on how you want to spell and pronounce it, is a very prominent figure from Welsh mythology who has also been connected with the moon. She is the personification of the moon in the sky. And in more recent times, into the 20th century, she has taken on even more personas and new lease of life. But for more about Caridwen and her connections with the moon and the night sky, I did record an episode all about that. That's episode 99, The Witch and the Moon, if you wanted to check that one out afterwards. But back to this episode, and it is considered, we are told, very dangerous to sleep in the moonlight, and especially for the moon's rays to fall on a sleeping child's face. So sleeping in the moonlight is bad. It's extra bad if you've got a child with you. And moonlight falling on the eyes of any sleeping person causes blindness, we are told. And this is difficult to cure, it adds. So I'm assuming that must mean the the blindness is a temporary blindness. Otherwise, it would be, well, it would be impossible, not difficult to cure. And if that wasn't enough, if the moon's rays haven't done enough damage yet, people say it will cause the person to become moonstruck. Moonstruck, which means a lunatic. So the moonlight can cause blindness, it can turn you into a lunatic, and just to top it all off, if that wasn't enough, if it shines in through the pantry window, much crockery will be broken. Much crockery will be broken, although I guess by this point, if you've gone blind and you're a lunatic, maybe broken crockery is going to be the least of your worries. Now, moving on, and if you hold a sixpence up to the new moon, you will never be short of money. That's a handy one. If you hold up a sixpence to the new moon, you will never be short of money. And then when it comes to the moon line, that's the beam that comes down from the moon, if lovers crossed the moon line together, they would never be married. So that's not so good, that one. Fishermen also avoided the moon line when setting out to sea. And we are told that we should never cross the moon line without wishing for something. So that's a good one. If you are going to cross the moon line, make a wish as you do so. And to wrap up this little section on the moon, we are going to turn to the waning moon. That is when the moon is is waning, is decreasing in size. And we are told that plants, herbs and flowers should not be planted at the time of the waning moon. That calves weaned at the time of the waning moon grow very lean. It is unlucky to kill a pig when the moon is waning. I would say it's unlucky to kill a pig at any time. But if it's something you are going to do, don't do it when the moon is waning. Because the curing will be unsatisfactory and the meat will shrink in boiling, roasting or toasting. Bad all around. This applies to fresh pork as well as to cured bacon and ham. So you can't try and trick this folklore by by making different kinds of, of meats out of it. Whatever you intended to use that pig for, whether it's for pork or whether it's bacon or ham or you're, you're going to do the, the Italian fifth quarter with the leftover bits, whatever it is, it is going to be bad. And finally, finally, with the moon. We are told that in Wales there was an old belief that incessant talkers were moon-led. So in a similar way to the moon making people into lunatics when they are moonstruck in childhood, the moon could also use its powers to transform you into an incessant talker. So if you do know somebody who talks too much, well, now you know why. It's not their fault, it's the moon's fault. But that's enough about the moon. Now it's time to move on to Rainbows. Yes, rainbows. Those magical, colourful things that light up the sky. Or, as they are known in Wales, or in Welsh folklore, I should say, in Welsh they are envis. But in Welsh folklore, they are known as Cadair Ceridwen. Cadair Ceridwen. Ceridwen is back again. And this time that means the chair or the seat of Ceridwen. And, to quote, In the days of old, the Welsh believed that the souls of heroes and kings and princes and all just people entered heaven by means of the rainbow, which was built by Gwydion, the son of Don. 
which conjures up a wonderfully Wagnerian image, and it shares many similarities. I'm sure it's been heavily influenced by the mythologies of other countries around Europe, where the great and the good make their way to heaven along the rainbow. It leads upwards. In this case, it's called Curridwen's Chair, and it was built by Gwydion, the son of Dawn. Now, Gwydion, the son of Dawn, is somebody who I've spoken about on previous episodes. Again, so I won't dwell on it too much, but he does have a special connection with Dylan Thomas, of all people, the poet Dylan Thomas, and that was on episode 105, if you wanted to check that one out later. But back to the rainbow and back to this image of the heroes, the great and the good, making their way upwards along the rainbow towards heaven, where they would be met by God's chair, in which he, and that's he with a capital H, suggesting the Lord himself, in which he sat watching those who entered heaven. And that's when you know you've really made it, when God himself is waiting at the entrance to welcome you in. Now, in the early part of the 19th century, we are told people considered it very unlucky to pass under a rainbow. And why was it unlucky, I can hear you asking? Well, it was, to quote, an omen of impending death, which is a pretty good reason, isn't it? If you walk under a rainbow, that was an omen of impending death. And also, in one of the more bizarre pieces of folklore I've ever included on this podcast, and I have included some rubbish over the years, but in one of the more bizarre pieces, to quote, and I certainly don't want to misquote this one, but to quote, In some places, there was an old story that if you passed under the rainbow, or it fell between you and other people, your sex would be changed. Make of that one what you will. Now, in a more common piece of law, which I think we can thank our Irish friends for, we are told that where the rainbow sprang out of the ground, a pot of gold or some kind of treasure was to be found, which is much nicer than impending death, you might find a pot of gold. And finally, to wrap up this section on rainbow law, to end on a high note, we are told that the Welsh say that the rainbow will cease appearing before the end of the world. So there's something to look forward to. If the rainbow ever disappears for good, it's time to start praying. Although thinking about it, if there's no rainbow, I guess that means you can no longer reach heaven. I'm not entirely sure how that all works. Maybe it's best not to think about it too hard. Let's just say if the rainbow disappears, it's it's time to start partying. The end is nigh. Now, next up is comets. Those icy lumps of gas and rock and and whatever they're made up of with nice long tails that fly through the sky. Comets. And comets, we are told, were supposed to appear before the birth or death of a king, a prince or very exalted person. For example, the birth of Owain Glyndwr, the last native prince of Wales, was said to be heralded by a comet and curious meteors with falling stars. And he certainly qualifies as a very exalted person. When Owain Glyndwr was born, we are told, there were comets and curious meteors and falling stars in the sky. And there was formerly a belief in Wales, even so late as the middle of the 19th century, that if the tale of a comet swept the earth, the world would be burnt and afterwards be effaced by a flood. So the last thing we need is a comet brushing the earth. And Donati's comet, we are told, which was sighted in 1858, struck terror among the rural population of Wales. And this might be because some believed the end of the world would be accomplished by means of fire and water. Fire and water would bring about the end of the world. And this episode is getting very biblical now. This is real Wrath of God stuff now. Stars falling from the sky and the earth being swept clean with fire and water. And if that wasn't enough doom and gloom for one episode, much like a 19th century, a passionate Welsh preacher, here's some more bad news. Because meteors, we are told, meteors falling like balls of fire to the earth indicated calamity to the nation or to some distinguished person, and dread followed the event. So meteors falling were bad news either for everyone or select important people. And it wasn't just from a Christian perspective that meteors were given this importance. From a pagan point of view, we are told that 
these meteors were supposed to form the fiery chariots in which the souls of the druids were conveyed to heaven. So maybe when these meteors were falling, the druids were making their way to a better place. Meanwhile, back on Earth, a substance which fell from meteors, or was found where they had fallen, was formerly known as Triparser, in English that is star jelly, which was considered to be very fortunate to find, and I think is a great name for something, some stuff that you find where a meteor has been. Look, look, star jelly. And as such, a meteoric stone found by anybody was carefully kept for luck, and the finder would have prosperity so long as they preserved it. So if you keep the meteor, keep it to yourself, and you personally will prosper, you will have the good luck. If, however, you gave the stone away, then you must expect misfortune, and if you sold it, some calamity would befall you and your family. So you're not just dooming yourself. If you try and flog a meteor for good luck, you're going to bring bad luck on you and your nearest and dearest. And as we are talking about bad luck again, as we seem to do a lot of on this podcast, but let's complete the trio of things that fall from the sky and bring bad luck. Because as well as comets, as well as meteors, there are shooting stars. And in some parts of Wales, they say you should expect express a wish while the star falls or you will be unlucky during the whole year. In other localities, they say you should utter a few words of the Lord's Prayer for luck when you see the shooting star. So if you see that star, it's time to start praying. And when shooting stars fell over a house, it foretokened the death of one of the inmates. So shooting stars are also death omens in their own way. And if they fell to the west of a town or village, there would be sorrow therein. So sorrow for the village there. And if to the east, some pleasure or festivity may be expected. So a bit of a bit of nice law there. Shooting stars fall into the east, you might have a party. To the north, they indicated a hard winter, and to the south, an unusually warm summer. And slightly contradicting what I said just seconds ago about shooting stars falling to the east of the village, if they fall to the east in general, it would be bad for man and beast. Man and beast. So it's not just bad for us, it's bad for the animals as well. So I guess that means if it falls to the east of the village, there might be some festivity, there might be a party on the way on the downside. There's also going to be some bad luck. Maybe you'll wake up with a, a hangover the next day or something. And if that wasn't bad enough, you'll be glad to know it gets even worse. Yes, it gets even worse. Because next we have thunder and lightning, which we are told above all other natural phenomena, was supposed by the older inhabitants of Wales to indicate the anger and punishment of God. During a thunderstorm, old people used to say, God is angry. God is angry. We are once more in the realm of biblical doom and gloom. And before I can continue, we are going to have a very quick language lesson. Fear not, a very, very quick language lesson. But the name Tyrannis, we are told, which is spelled T-A-R-A-N-I-S, is handed down as one of the Celtic deities and would have been known to the people of Gaul and across Britain and Ireland and the Germanic people and beyond. So, this was a very well-known deity many, many years ago. And while the name Tyrannus itself isn't so well-known nowadays, a word derived from it is. Because in the Welsh language, the word for thunder is Taran or Taranai, which is derived from this deity's name. This Taranis, their name survives in the Welsh language today in the word for thunder. And by all accounts, other languages have used a similar approach and have derived words for thunder from his name. Now, sadly, I'm ashamed to admit I can only speak two languages. It's just English and Welsh. But maybe if you're lucky enough to speak one of these other languages, if you can speak French or German, maybe one of the Scandinavian languages, one of the other languages native to Britain and Ireland and Italian, maybe, if you can speak those languages and you can think of a word derived from this deity's name, please let me know on social media. Now, it's time for a quick story, a story about 
God and Thunder, which sounds like it might be the name of a new Marvel film, but in fact, it's a piece of old Welsh folklore, and it goes like this. A very old man remembered his grandfather saying that his great-grandfather, living in the end of the 17th century, used to tell a story of an ox being led up and down the fields when thunder brooded, and the herdsman would implore God to drive the thunder away or to send protecting rain with it. So, if there's storm clouds brewing, get outside and walk your ox and pray to God for rain to go with it. And this was very important because in the early 1900s at least, the Welsh still dreaded a thunderstorm without rain, for it is regarded as extremely dangerous. During the storm, it was formally and still is, we are told, customary to fasten all doors and windows. Maybe that's more common sense than folklore. Sometimes two sheathed knives were crossed outside a window to prevent the house being struck. I don't know if that works or not, but two sheathed knives were crossed outside a window to prevent the house being struck. And in former years, when a person heard thunder for the first time in the season, they took a stone and tapped their forehead with it three times to prevent headaches during the next 12 months. So that's a nice bit of law at the end there. If you tap your head three times, with a stone, when you hear thunder for the first time, you can prevent headaches for the next 12 months. Failing that, you might just get some strange looks. Now, the same authority who told us that story also had another tale about lightning. And he said that there was an old belief that the thunderbolt dived into the earth in the shape of a black wedge and remained in the earth for seven or nine years when it returned to the surface again, and every time it thundered, the bolt ascended nearer the surface. As such, if a thunderbolt or wedge was preserved indoors, the house would be proof against damage by lightning. The thunderstone, meanwhile, was supposed to possess healing or restorative powers, especially in nervous affections and fits for which it was carried in the pocket. In the older folklore, Thunder was supposed to be caused by God pursuing the devil and dashing him to the underworld. Fearing the devil would take refuge in the house, all entrances were instantly closed. And again, I think this goes back to more common sense than anything else. If there's a storm outside, lock your doors and close your windows. Now, it's time for some more quickfire folklore, and this time about thunder and lightning. And it was considered dangerous to take refuge under an oak during a thunderstorm, for the lightning penetrated 50 times deeper into it than any other tree. So I think we all know about keeping away from trees during a thunderstorm, but according to this bit of law, stay away from oaks in particular. If you have to cower under a tree, choose another tree. Animals struck by lightning were considered unfit for human food, being poisonous. Places struck by lightning were cursed. People struck by lightning must have been very sinful. At one time, church bells were rung to drive the thunder and lightning away. And this practice was kept up in Wales until the early 19th century. And if that failed, if ringing the bells of God did not drive away the thunder and lightning, then we are told shooting into the sky was supposed to be efficacious for the same purpose. Personally, I think you're better off ringing the bells. Never mind shooting. Don't shoot anything. Just stick to the bells. And in another bizarre bit of of law. There's been a few bizarre bits on this episode so far. I really am putting all the bizarre nonsense into one bizarre episode together. But we are told the redbreast and the beetle attracted lightning. That's the robin. Redbreast and beetles attracted lightning for some reason. So keep them out of your house. And some inanimate objects containing glass, steel, and all glittering articles all had the same power. Glittering articles, I don't know what that means, but it sounds like the glam rock period would have been a terrible time for attracting lightning. Quick, scrub those glittery stars off your face. Or maybe not. But for this reason, looking glasses, 
pewter vessels and bright brasses were covered at the approach of thunder and lightning. It really was a case of batten down the hatches, cover everything, lock the doors, lock the windows, kick out the robins and beetles and hope for the best. Now, as for the outside, the buildings themselves, well, the exterior, we've sorted the interior, hopefully, but the exterior could be protected using stone crop. That's a form of succulent that was formerly planted on the roofs of old thatch houses to, well, to keep thunder and lightning away, I guess. Maybe there was another reason. Maybe it just looked nice as well. And we are told that on many habitations in Wales, the stone crop is still to be seen, and also on old barns and granaries. So maybe this belief persists. Maybe people just like looking at stone crop. But if all of this fails, if this all fails, you follow these instructions and your house is still struck by lightning. Well, that can only mean one thing. Because, to quote, people at one time gravely asserted that if a thunderbolt or lightning struck a building in any hamlet, village or town, there was an evil inhabitant in it. So, you must be evil if the stone crop didn't work, or at least live with someone who is assumed to be evil. And if you live on your own, that should make it a little bit easier to pinpoint who the culprit might be. And this does tie in with a saying that old inhabitants, good old old inhabitants, but a saying that old inhabitants had that it was God's judgment that you were struck for some secret sin or wickedness. So nothing to do with luck. If you were struck, it's your own fault for all those those wicked thoughts, those sinful deeds, or whatever you've been up to. It's none of my business, really. But if your house is hit by lightning, it sounds like you've only got yourself to blame. And to wrap things up with thunder and lightning, and to wrap things up for this episode, let us now turn to a bit of bad news for one person in particular in the community. And we are told that when thunder was heard and lightning was seen, between the first day of November and the last day of January, for that three-month window, the people said the most important person in the parish would die within the year of the occurrence. Bad news for whoever was considered to be the most important person in the parish. I guess if that did happen, you'd suddenly have mayors and people trying to give up their titles. And no, 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 you take it, you take it until until February at least anyway. And finally, the year in which thunderstorms were unusually prevalent. If there was a lot of thunderstorms, more than normal, this was called a bad and wicked year. And it was generally believed that very serious crimes were committed in it. So if the weather is bad, there is a lot of wickedness in the world. And I guess this brings us back to one of the reoccurring themes in this episode, and that when this terrible weather is lashed down upon us, it is usually a vengeful God paying us back for our wicked ways. Maybe I did miss my calling in life by not becoming a 19th century fire and brimstone passionate Welsh preacher after all. But on that rather moralistic note, so ends another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, if you enjoyed this sermon and you haven't already, please consider hitting the subscribe button and you will never miss an episode ever. If you really enjoyed this episode, you can support the podcast by treating me to a coffee via my website or you could just leave a nice review or a nice rating. If you'd like more Ghosts and Folklore, you can follow me on social media. And as well as this podcast, I've also written a number of books about similar weird and wonderful subjects which are available from all good bookshops offline and on. All of which just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And remember... If it's raining right now as you're listening to these words, if it's blowing a gale outside, if the heavens have opened and there is thunder and lightning lashing down on you, well, you've only got yourself to blame. Until next time, no star. No star.